standard slides, and we're going to be looking at Metabo Analyst. It's the software that we're going to learn about today. And just sort of as an introduction to Metabo Analyst, remember that we're doing a metabolomics experiment where we'll have collections of samples, biological and technical replicates typically, so dozens to hundreds of samples. And from those biological samples, we're going to be measuring hundreds thousands of metabolites. Now, it could be metabolites, it could be genes, it could be proteins. the same thing, but uh, conceptually we're going to be working with metabolites. Now, you can measure metabolites in the targeted approach, which is what we talked about largely yesterday, or you can measure metabolites and bins and peaks in the untargeted approach. Both are valid, both are used, both are useful. I've told you my bias or preference. Um, hopefully I've convinced you of its, of its merits. But they're still both used and both useful. And they both have a certain type of workflow. So with the targeted one, uh, typically we'll, we saw yesterday where we looked at our, our, our spectra, for instance, and we saw that you know, with the quality of the spectral data, you fixed it. Uh, then you did some compound identification with that. You did some compound quantification. And at that point, you could have downloaded the data or saved it as a file. And you might have done, you know, that was one biological sample. You do it for 10, 20, 100. Then the next step that you'll have to do is to try and do some data normalization. And that normalization, as I say, can mean scaling, that is adjusting for concentration differences. Some things are dilute, like urine can be diluted. Blood, you don't have to worry about. CSF, sometimes. Um, but then the other aspect of normalization, remember, was converting a log distribution to a normal distribution. So these are the two things that you actually have to do after your data has been compiled. And then you might look at your data as well to see if there's some outliers, some mistakes, some data entry errors, typos things that were just all zeroed because whatever happened. So this is quality tracking, quality assurance, outlier removal. And then the next part is the data reduction. And the data reduction is dimension reduction, PCA, data analysis, data interpretation, pathway mapping, all those things. So that is the process for workflow. Now with the chemometric or untargeted approaches, which is more common for MS-based uh, techniques. First thing to do is to check your data, see if the spectra are there, and if they're properly you know, referenced or normalized. The next thing to do is then to take the spectra and align them. So if you collect 100 spectra, whether it's HPLCs or TICs or whatever, you're going to try and match them all up. Hopefully they've been collected under good conditions. That alignment then allows you to, um, sometimes you can work straight with the aligned spectra. Uh, if you're data limited or computer limited, you can bin the data. So that sort of helps reduce it. It allows you to just focus on the peaks and ignore the noise. Then you can do some of the data scaling. This is then you know, making sure that everything is adjusted to the right concentrations. Uh, also trying to see if you can get the distributions of those relative heights so that they're normalized. Then there's the quality control, checking to see that there weren't strange things, noise removal, noise reduction, outlier reduction. Then you now have your data and you can do PCA, and you can do the data analysis, but at this stage everything is just peak 1, peak 2, peak 3. So you've now done your PCA, you've identified peak 1 and peak 2 are distinct from peak 3. That's when you have to go to your compound identification and figure out what was the thing that was driving those things from being separated. So this method uh, is say, used by a lot of people. This is where the, the challenge is. Um, because if you found a nice separation and the things that in your um, loadings plot clearly show you know, these two peaks out here are driving the separation, you've got to hope that you can identify those two peaks. If you can't, then you can't publish. Okay, so in all of them, they, there is this, they all begin with a data integrity check. 
Uh, so in some cases, it's this issue of trying to identify false positives. Um, so you know, these are presumably all controls, all replicates, technical replicates, or something like that. And, and what you're seeing here is that you know this is the normal one, but now you're seeing this thing changing. It shifted, or it appeared, and disappeared. Um, so, you know, what's going on? So you might have to try and figure out, is this stuff that's contaminating the column, stuff that's contaminating the inlet, the probe? Um, we've talked about things with adducts in mass spec. Gas chromatography, we didn't talk about the issue of extra derivatization products. These produce sort of false positives. There's the isotopomers. Uh, there's certain breakdown products, neutral loss elements, ionization. All of those things can produce this sort of flaky data. So this is not a problem with NMR. It's a different technology, different technique. Um, it's partly saved because it's not that sensitive. Um, so lack of sensitivity is one, one benefit, <laughs> oddly enough. Anyways, obviously people will then check to see if they can eliminate some of this data. And there are programs that come with um, um, various uh, mass spec systems to help do this, but then there are manual ways to also help eliminate some of these things. So you, you check your data, you try and get rid of the false positives, you try and merge your peaks so that the, you're not counting adducts eight times or isotopomers 12 times. Um, once you've done that, then you can start doing the, the next phase, which is sort of that spectral or data alignment. And, um, you know, if it's a total ion chromatogram or an HPLC or UPLC, this is not unusual, um, where you're seeing this is one run in red, and then half hour later this is the next run, same or similar sample. There's a drift. And this is particularly problematic for LC. Um, what you can do is with software, you can actually shift these things to deal with the drift. Um, sometimes the column wears out, things start stretching out, peaks start broadening. Um, so you can do the alignment, and the favorite one I think many people use is XCMS uh, to do alignment, but there are other ones, Home A, MZ Mine. Um, and the technique is called time warping, which does this sort of alignment. And I've listed some places that you can grab or download these, these different alignment algorithms. This used to be more common. It's not done so often today, but um, binning is a way of essentially grouping uh, peaks together. And it allows you to get rid of essentially noisy data. Or um, So it, it was when CPUs were a little smaller and, and memory was a little tougher. but Conceptually, it's still a way of, of, of clustering or grouping things so that you can get um, peaks and simplifying the spectra to some extent. So you can, this is commonly done on NMR, could also be done in mass spec. But as I say, it's sort of an optional thing, um, but it still creates groups um, and peaks. So you've tried to clean your data, you've tried to uh, align your data, maybe you've done some binning. Now you do this normalization slash scaling. This is important. Um, you know, this could be a sample from one person, uh, and this could be a sample uh, from the same person at a different time, or it could be a sample from a different person. And you can kind of see that these two look very similar in overall positions, where the peaks are, but you can see that one is about twice, maybe three times higher. Um, is this a real difference? Um, is this, you know, tuning related to the sensitivity of the detector? Is this dilution effect? If this was urine, maybe the person uh, at the bottom had been drinking a gallon of water or something. Um, so this is one of the issues that you basically have to deal with is, is, are we dealing with a dilution effect because someone added too much buffer, someone drank too much, um, 
or are we dealing with a real phenomena that these are physically very different individuals or different processes? So you can deal sometimes to the whole sample to deal with dilution. Um, you can deal sometimes with trying to look at the total integrated area and trying to match the total integrated area. Uh, and there's things that are used like probabilistic quotient methods. Sometimes people put in internal standards to make sure that the same concentration is, is being measured. Um, and it depends. It depends on the sample. Urine, that's a big one. Blood, it's not so much an issue. Cell samples, cell extracts, as long as it's the same number of cells, it shouldn't be an issue. But only the experimentalist can know what sort of scaling factor they need to do. Um, it's, it's something that can't necessarily be uniformly applied. So, I have a question. So, here, the scaling and the normalization, they're separate and different, right? So, the, yeah. They are. As I say, it's just that the people will use the terms interchangeably. So. So here, normalization, you mean real statistical normalization and the scaling of the yeah. manners. So yeah, so. yeah. Okay. Um, so sometimes people will scale to certain features. Uh, so here's some you know, unique feature here. Um, but you know, if you try to work on only that, then you probably, because there's only a tiny, tiny amount here, that's you know, something you ignore. So then you look at these ones, which are perhaps more informative. Um, and then, in terms of after scaling, then you can do the normalization, which is trying to get things so that the concentrations follow some normal curve, as opposed to some sort of skewed thing. So that's another thing that you still have to do after the scaling. And uh, so there's the log transformation, auto-scaling, and things like that. Do you need to do that on a compound-by-compound No, well, we'll show you in this case that the, the, the software, that the metabolanalyst will do this uniformly, and so it'll it'll sort it out or, or generate a... But you you don't know which method is going to give you a nice normal distribution. Uh, so you typically have to try a couple and you iterate. So it's, okay, let's try log transformation. Sometimes you don't even have to do anything at all and it's nicely normally distributed. Um, so um, those are things that you have to um, adjust for. Um, okay, so we've done those first three steps, I think, in our, or in our flow, our data flow. And then the next one is quality checking, quality assurance, some aspects of outlier removal, and then, and then the data reduction. So, you know, the quality checking, outlier removal, I mean, sometimes we can remove solvent peaks, we can remove noise, we can remove outliers, we can get rid of false positives. But typically, if you're removing data, make sure you have some reasonable justification. Don't remove data because it makes my fit better. That's, that's um, unethical. Um, and then after you clean things up, then we do the PLSDA, the PCA, whatever else you want, and maybe clustering. And so that's when we get into the dimension reduction and, and all that fun multivariate statistical stuff. So the QC here is really based on data we got, because what I heard is that from the instrument, you have another QC, right? Yeah, there's multiple levels where you need to do quality control. I mean, one level you're trying to make sure the instrument is producing reproducible uh, data. And so you will put in every 10th sample or every 20th sample something that has a defined uh, composition or a standardized sample, and you'll compare those quality control samples through this or even right there to see if they look identical and are superimposable and everything else. Um, there may be quality control checks that you do to make at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day to make sure the instrument's tuned properly, it detects a certain standard a compound. Um, and then what you'll find is that over the course, because you can rarely do a metabolomics experiment over one day. It may take several weeks or months. And then you're going to look to see how that varies over days or, or weeks. Sometimes you may be combining data from different platforms. So again, you want to be able to find out if there's ways of combining them. This is another point about quantitative metabolomics, is that combining data from platforms is trivial, whereas if you are using only chemometric methods, combining from different platforms, forget it. So, um, but 
if you've been working on one platform for a long time, you want to see if there are if there's systematic drift that will have happened. And it's, we'll show some examples, or we'll see this at the end of this lecture, where you're seeing some tests that have taken over you know, multiple weeks, and you're seeing the very first batch of 80 samples is one level, and the last batch of 80 samples, which is you know, largely the same group, it's way up here. There was a drift. It has to be normalized or scaled, so it's brought back down to the normal values. Um, so um, all of those things are done and need to be done, um, just because instruments aren't perfect, people aren't perfect. Um, things drift over time. Okay, so we're going to talk about MetaboAnalyst. So I've gone through the general workflow of how you do it, and MetaboAnalyst is a server to basically support that kind of workflow, both for targeted and for non-targeted metabolomics. And it's been designed to work for NMR, for LCMS, and GCMS, so the major platforms. You can do univariate statistics, you can do multivariate statistics. So all the things we saw earlier, T-test, SANOVA, PCA, PLSDA. Um, it does this on the web, it does this with graphics, it does this with nice plots, it explains things. It's designed to help people do analysis, especially those who aren't fluent in R or MATLAB or do statistics in their dreams. Um, what we try and do is, is also link that data to other types of resources that we've developed and what we talked about yesterday, like the Small Molecule Path Database or the HMDB or KEG or other resources. So the workflow is similar. It's the data pre-processing. That's the thing we talked about, quality checks and everything else. The data normalization, which is scaling slash normalization to uh, Gaussian. Then there's the data reduction, which is sort of the data analysis. It can also be data annotation, uh, especially if you're having to do that at the end of an untargeted study. So this is a little more in detail. So you can put in a variety of data. You can put in raw spectra. You can put in peak lists. You can put in bins. Or you can put in those tables that you got from the genomics, which is inchi identifier concentration, which is, as I say, the, the recommended input that, that more and more people are suggesting. So once the data is in, then you can do a variety of things. You can, so for the data are spectra, then you can do some spectral processing if the list of peaks. You can do some peak processing if they're bins or spectra. You can do some noise filtering. If they're concentration tables or peak lists, then you can also do some missing value estimations, which help deal with the normalization problem. Um, so you're dealing with hundreds, perhaps tens of thousands of data items. So there's a data integrity check, uh, just to make sure that everything has been entered correctly. Then we can do this scaling slash normalization. Um, and this is where you interactively see how you can change it. your data set, which may have been very skewed, or may have some odd concentrations out of the molar level and everything else is a millimolar level. Um, and so you can try and get the data to look like it's a normal distribution. If you don't do this, everything you do from here on is probably not correct. So that normalization step is sort of an interactive one. You don't know whether it's going to be a log transformation. You don't know if you don't have to do any transformation. You don't know if you have to do row rise, or you don't have to know if you do column wise normalization. So you do an interactive thing. You try this, try this, try that. Finally, if you're happy with the normalization process, then you can start doing the data reduction. So for the data, should we start from the row normalization, or I mean? Which one do the first? Um, I can't remember actually right now which one's first typically, but it's usually it's I think is it would you do be row is the most common one? I can't remember. Row and column are combined, but if you just row and it's column, you see that's like none. So you have to sequentially or just two and one, but all the results are right. We'll go through that a little later. And, and, um, 
from here you have several things. You can do the, the multi-group analysis, which we spent the morning going through. You can do time series analysis. This is a longitudinal study. This is <coughs> cross-sectional studies. Whether either of these, then you can do the next one, which is to try and get some biological interpretation. So you can do pathway analysis. You could do enrichment analysis. And this is similar to gene set enrichment analysis, but this is metabolite separate enrichment. So this is where you can take that sort of raw, those clusters, and actually go to people and say, you know what, these are the pathways that have been changed, these are the metabolites that are, are, are most, most interesting. Um, we can then take that data and spit it out into tables, graphs, images at very high resolution. We can also do other things that we could have done also up here. We could do some quality checking, check things like temporal drift batch effects. Uh, so this could have been put here or here. Um, and then if I said we were starting with just raw LCMS data and we got some nice clusters, now we want to figure out what those compounds are. So there is support for, for data annotation. Um, yes? Um, I got into some trouble in the past with missing value annotation. Mm -hmm. um, or estimation. Uh, on the one hand, if you just sort of fill in the same value for everything, you reduce the variation. On the other hand, you try things like multiple annotation and end up overfitting and even lifting the signal. Uh, what are some things that you like to do for missing value um, The one that we most often do is it's for missing values for, for the type of metabolomics we do, which is more targeted, is if we can't see it, we know it's below our detection limit. We know what our detection limit is, and then we take that detection limit and divide it by two it then becomes a common value. So it's not zero, but it is a value. The uni value is uniform. But if it's, so at least it's, um, I mean, you could make it have some variation about some norm, about half the, half the value of the lowest limit of detection. Um, there are problems when you, when you zero things. I think Jeff has a comment. Yeah, and I think, I mean, one of the things that's becoming clear, and this is maybe, as, as Jeff was pointing out, if you didn't hear, but is if, you, if you're seeing mostly missing values, um, get rid of it, <laughs> the whole thing, basically. Human, animal, plant, microbial variation is not that large. Um, so, uh, yes, we can see things varying by a factor of two, but it's 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 not you're not going to find a situation where people in this room, if we were looking at their urine or their blood or their CSF, where someone's going to have only half the compounds that another is. They're they're going to have exactly the same compounds. They may have a variation of five percent. So someone took acetaminophen this morning. I didn't. I'm not going to have that in my CSF. Okay, that's one compound. 
but it's not going to be representing uh, you know, half the variation. So in LCMS, as you say, there's lots of situations where you're going to see these things. I think that's this is leading to a lot of problems. Um, and really what you want to do is get to the point where you're um, only taking the ones where there's high reproducibility, about 75-80 percent that are common peaks. So that's, yes, that's cutting down what you're seeing, but that's, that's, that represents the real variation in, in animal systems. We're not that different. Um, and, and when we do this with uh, you know, techniques like NMR, where everything is identified, that's about what we will see. Is this about an 80, 90 percent consistency of what is in, in each organism sample or whatever. Okay, so we're going to go through MetaboAnalyst, and we're going to look at four steps. We're going to do raw data processing, we're going to do data reduction, dimension reduction, PCA, then we're going to do metabolite set enrichment analysis, and then we're going to do metabolite pathway analysis. MSEA is, was um, a separate module, it's now part of MetaboAnalyst. MetPA is, was a separate module, it's now part of Metabolanist, so you can access them both ways, I suppose, but we're going to treat this as all one happy family. So this is a step through, so I'm not doing it live, because sometimes the internet will die, or it's hard to do while you're talking, so I'm taking screenshots, uh, and we're talking about these things, and the idea is that after lunch you guys are going to go through these, some of these screenshots, and you're going to walk through this. You're going to run the program, and you're going to access it. So, anyways, this is what the home page looks like, or close to the home page, and uh, it'll explain some things, and there are uh, overviews, you can read that, and there's different data formats. So by clicking on this panel, you can navigate to different regions in the program. Um, Jeff is a person who wrote this, so he's here, so he can answer more of the questions than I can. Um, it's been out for a couple of years. It's used by uh, an average, I don't know, 100 people a day, I think. Um, so we've had to upgrade the server about four times <laughs> um, because the use is pretty intense. So if we click to the data formats, there are some example data sets that are provided. Um, so there's one of the data sets we're going to look at is cow data, um, just because it's different enough. Um, but there are things, uh, this is with compound concentrations, so this is the targeted approach. And we're doing this for a couple reasons, partly to keep consistent with what we did in the theme for this, but it's also faster. The data processing is faster when you have concentration tables. If we were using um, time series peak intensity data or bin data, it takes longer. So we don't, if we've got 16 people hitting the site, it's, it's just not going to work. So for saving time for data processing, we're using compound concentration data. Uh, there are also other zip files that, are, that people can use, including the full LCMS data. This is one that you can download and then try and process. And that's fairly taxing on this server, but it can work. There's an explanation of the format, so it follows comma separated value, which is the Excel format. So every Excel spreadsheet can be saved as a .csv file. So first thing to do is to convert that data into matrices that are suitable for statistical analysis. So peak list, spectral bins, and raw spectra can be converted into tables. We're working on concentration data. We're going to also convert that, and that's almost already converted. It's almost ready um, to, to be suitable for statistical analysis. So we can go, uh, once you've gone to the first step, there's upload your data. And you can see these different steps. Upload, process, do some statistics, do metabolite site enrichment, do pathway analysis. And after you've, if you've got untargeted data, you can figure out what your compounds are, and start labeling your metabolites. Since we already have concentration data, we don't even have to worry about this. We 
shouldn't just worry about these ones. So here's our data format. In this case, we actually uploaded the, the cattle data. Um, but it identifies, it can identify whether we've got concentration data or whether it's peak data or spectral bins. Uh, it could have been a zipped file, we'll ask, it'll ask that. But, and then it'll ask whether the samples are in rows or in columns. So you have to know that. Um, so here's the data, as I said, this is, this is rumen samples, 39 samples. They're measured with NMR. They were fed different proportions of grain. So you can imagine it's a bunch of cattle, and they're on grain diets, and they're on grain diets for, I don't know, two weeks. And then they go from grass to grain to more grain and to lots of grain. And this is how they do sort of fattening up for cattle and, and also to improve milk production. And cattle are designed to eat grass. They're not designed to eat grain. And so they've known for many years that as you increase grain, cattle start having problems. Some of them get into very serious problems. Um, but they wanted to know what it was doing. And so in this case, they were sampling what was going on in their stomachs. Uh, that's the rumen. So these are, as I say, different types of test data you can sample. You can click on it uh, and upload it. And as I say, dairy cattle, you can also do it with beef cattle, you get similar results in different proportions. Grass-fed, uh, oats and barley at 15, 30, and 45 percent of the diet. Stick a needle in them, pull out their rumen, that's the digestive food, um, and then analyze through NMR, just like what you guys did for CSF. And then, as I said, grain is known to be stressful to cattle and actually kills a lot of them. Um, so we've uploaded our data, and now it does a data integrity check. So it says data content passed. It's identifying four groups, 0%, 15%, 30%, 45%. Um, these are not paired. This is an unpaired t-test sort of thing. 39 samples. 47 metabolites, so 39 cows, 10 for each of the four sets of groups. All the numbers are numeric, uh, non-negative, concentrations shouldn't be negative. If there are, then you know you've got a typo. Uh, there's some zero values, um, and missing values, so no missing values. Again, people can often make mistakes. Um, in the case of the zero values, uh, we're, we're putting these two small values, and those can be arbitrarily chosen or are calculated uh, based on the data. Anyways, everything looks fine to us, so we can you know, go ahead and skip some of the stuff. Um, now we want to do the normalization. So the rows and columns, so let's see, the rows were the samples and the columns were the metabolites. Um, so, in many cases with rows, you may not need to normalize at all, um, but you could also normalize to a reference sample, which was chosen here. And then there's the column-wise normalization. So these are the metabolites. Say so you're having things that are millimolar and micromolar, and the question is, are they normally distributed or not? So we could have said none. We could have done a log scale, which is, you know, takes something that goes like this and converts it to we can do something called auto scaling, um, Pareto scaling, range scaling, and the explanations and citations for these are provided in the website, so you can learn a little bit about them. So in this case, we've chosen to normalize by a reference sample. I think arguably we could have just done none, and then we've done auto scaling, which works really well for things like urine and rumen. Anyway, so we now have a data matrix. So the samples are in rows, and the compounds, metabolites, are in columns. So these are the different types of row normalization, row-wise or column-wise. Uh, we're trying to make the rows comparable to each other. Um, so in this case, if there was a dilution effect, so this is sort of the scaling, um, this would sort of try and help deal with that. Principle, there shouldn't have been because uh, rumen isn't like urine. So we didn't try and deal with a scaling or uh, adjustment for dilutions. 
But in terms of the column-wise, we're trying to deal with the, the huge range in concentrations, some at sub-micromolar, some at, at high millimolar. And so we have things of different orders of magnitude. In some cases with mass spec, you'll have things at nanomolar and at millimolar. So you've got, you know, a six-fold concentration range. So when those concentration ranges are quite large, as I say, there's log transformation, which is most common, auto scaling, which works pretty well for a lot of things, Pareto and range scaling. So, as I say, for the, the row-wise, we didn't really have to do it. Now we're looking at the metabolite concentrations, and this is usually where the biggest problem is. And you can see that there's most of the things are very low levels of concentration, probably in the micromolar. But then there's a couple of compounds, butyrate and acetate, which are in the high millimolar range. And so what you've got here is essentially a, a distribution that is almost exponential. And you can't do good statistics on an exponential distribution. So we did auto scaling, and now we've changed what looks to be very biased to something which looks kind of nice, and in fact what's shown here is the distribution of concentrations. And to my eye, that looks like a normal or Gaussian distribution. Now we could have tried log scaling, you could try that, and maybe you'll get a curve that looks maybe a little squarer. That also looks normal. There's no, it's, it's, it's a qualitative assessment to say how normal does this look, but that is a good normal distribution. You can end up situations sometimes where all your scaling doesn't help and you end up with uh, fine little ones. And then you've got kind of a problem. You probably have to break your data set up into two parts. Can we do the log to transform and then do the normalization? Can well, we could have done the log transformation. We had the option. So this was auto scaling. Yeah. So we could have turned this one off and just clicked log and then. We press go. I mean, first do log and then do auto, auto scaling. Yeah. No, I don't think it supports two at the same time. It's one or the other. Uh, can you can you try all four? You really don't want to do so many. I understand it's just. Yeah, because I mean, basically, you microarray, we using the routine in the uh, pipeline that first uh, take the log transformation and then you do the normalization, I mean, yeah. the auto scaling. Yeah. Auto scaling already put the square root, so it's a bit like log, already try to uh, Oh, I see. So then oh, I see. it's divided by the unit, unit error. So already did by the string. If you, on top of that, it's doing a log. It's I kind of same log, like twice. I see, I see, I see. Is it possible, like, I don't know which one's the best. I do uh, one by one, all four, and compare them. That's right. And then decide which one is. Yeah. Yeah. I have another question. Yeah. Sure. So, on the workflow, I say there's alignment. So, we do not do alignment. We're not doing alignment because what we're doing with is concentration data. So, alignment is something that you do for the untargeted one. And so, um, yeah, that, that's being skipped for this demo here. So if you've got a bimodal distribution, you might as well treat it as two different experiments, okay. two different platforms, whatever you want. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, you have to, so the most important one is actually the column wise in this case, it's normalizing the concentrations. So if you don't do that, then a lot of the statistics kind of mess up. Um, the the, the row-wise or sample normalization or scaling in this case, which is mostly for dilution effects or some sort of systematic bias that may have occurred, um, 
that's important to see, it's important to know. Um, um, but uh, typically if you're sampling from, you know, blood, sampling from probably CSF, if you're sampling from cell extracts where the same number of cells have been taken and you've been careful about that, um, you shouldn't really have to do row-wise normalization. Um, but because the instruments that we work with can measure concentrations over from, you know, nanomolar to almost molar, then you do need to do um, um, often column rise or sample, uh, or not sample, but metabolite normalization. I think we, we found this issue, we were talking about this the other day, so there's a, this Biocrates kit that generates mass spec, and it, it has a bunch of metabolites that are up in the millimolar range and a whole bunch of metabolites in the nanomolar range. So you typically get a bimodal distribution. And I don't think we've been critical enough because when we do, when we do the Biocrates data, we don't get this quite so nicely. We get something that's sometimes bimodal. And really what we should be doing then is just splitting the two and treating the two as, as two different uh, experiments, arguably. Um, so what happens to that, uh, the most extreme concentration? Where does that fall under? This it one, comes with the um, others. Like yeah. I don't know. I, th I think it's actually up here. So in, in the normalized concentration, does it appear in the middle of the peak or at the rightmost end? Uh, the one that's at the highest concentration. This one? Yes. So this is the maximum concentration? No, I mean the green bar. Oh, the green, the green bar? bar. So this it is the should... average, this is the scan, one yes. standard deviation. Where does it go in the normalized concentration? Oh, where does this... So this one is now here. Yeah. But so is, that, is that really true? I mean... So this has gone through auto scaling. So isn't it supposed to be still represent the highest concentration? Well, Should I think if we if we done log normalization, it, it would have, have it would have been shifted. But auto scaling shifted things in a couple different ways. And so Jeff. Oh. So this is, it's really closer to a rank normalization. So even though it's very high, in terms of the rank where it was, it's so, in the middle. So you mean center, which means you use, you use the mean of this compound itself, right? Yes. Mean and variance of this column compound is. Shouldn't we use the global mean rather than the... Oh, the global mean. This is a really auto scan really standard. You apply because global mean, if you apply this, you same value global mean, the whole trend of this number yeah, no, no, no. Okay. Yeah, right, but uh, Yeah, I understand that. But uh, this is a really standard procedure. I mean, <laughs> I mean the, the the question isn't that you're trying to answer isn't whether acetate is high. It's whether acetate is higher under certain conditions. So if you, if you do the rank normalization, you find how that population moves as you change conditions. Whether it's, you know, plus or minus one or plus or minus another mean is somewhat arbitrary. So uh, if you are looking at univariate, we really compare the absolute concentration to the area, not on the original, not a transform. If you look at a multivariate, you really it is in a variance of overall things. So doing this transformation, your variance Relatively, we're saying not to, not absolute value. So that's a uh, that's a concept behind it, how we, why we're doing this. But if we, in your case, it's really doing universal. 
Okay, so I think we'll move on. So that's the normalization. And I think as Jeff pointed out, these are, are standard protocols. Uh, they're standardly used, so they're not special to this. It's just, and I, I think as, as, as Chris was pointing out, we're really just trying to see, we're not worried about the absolute values, we're worried about the relative changes. Um, so now there's an aspect of quality control and this is something that, because we're dealing with um, concentration tables, we don't have to worry that much about. Um, but if we were dealing with uh, bins and spectra, this is sometimes an issue. Um, still, um, as I mentioned or was shown in the diagram, there are things that you can do for quality checking with drift and time drift and overall chair. But there are things sometimes where we've got um, we did look for missing values, but we could also look for values where there's typos. Typos are not going to be detected in that original data quality check. Um, so some of these typos could be picked up by inspection. So here's an example of a typographical error um, where actually we did principal component analysis and we actually see two very nice clusters. And then we see this out here. And um, it could be real, but what you want to do is go back and look at your number. And in this case, it was probably not real, and someone had forgotten to put a zero in or put the decimal in the wrong place. Here's another one where you could use a clustering diagram. This is also called the heat map or hierarchical clustering. But you can see this black line here. And that's actually this same thing here showing up. So, again, some sort of typographical mistake. So, you couldn't have picked that up in that very first fix, which is just looking at, you know, missing values and everything in rows and columns. But this allows you to sort of sort some of these things out and, and to go back and see if you had some typos. Uh, you can go back, rather than re-enter everything and start all over, you can actually get back straight into the sample editor and actually delete that problem value. Um, but this is not something you should do to say, oh, I don't like this, uh, this doesn't make my curve look normal, and I'd like something that would be better, I'm just going to bleed this until I finally get the answer I want. No, this is just to try and identify something that, as I say, is an obvious typo here. Uh, there's noise reduction. This is, again, something that's more particular or specific for um, um, raw data rather than the, the concentration type data. But there are tools for doing some filtering uh, to eliminate certain um, variables, peaks. So this is important for particularly LCMS data uh, and certain types of GCMS data. Um, and it uses, again, standard techniques that people have identified um, for doing this sort of noise reduction. Okay, so um, those last few slides, as I say, were more specific to um, uh, raw data, uh, but, but in terms of the concentration tables, uh, as I say, you can look for some outliers, uh, but now we're more interested in data reduction and analysis. So this is where you've done your study, control diseased, or growth media one, growth media two, whatever it is. Um, and we're trying to identify the important features, important patterns, differences between phenotypes, trying to classify and predict. So after we've finished our processing or pre-processing, we now have our statistics. And now we can start doing a whole bunch of things. We can look at full change analysis. We can do the T-tests, volcano plots, ANOVA. We can do some correlation analysis, PCA, PLSDA, significance analysis of microarrays slash metabolites. Bayesian analysis, we can do heat maps, um, self-organizing feature maps, k-means partitioning, random forest to support vector machines. These are all supported. Um, so this is quite an array of tools, actually. Um, and many people only need to use a couple, um, but you can explore and try all of them as you wish. Um, so 
what's highlighted here, we're going to try and do some ANOVA analysis, some PCA, some PLSDA, and some hierarchical clustering. So by clicking on those things, it allows you to enter into the analysis. So if we've uploaded our data, it's there. We can just click on ANOVA, and here is our analysis of variance. Uh, we're dealing with four groups, remember? 0, 15, 30, and 45. So you use ANOVA, not t-tests. We're trying to see if any one of these are different. Um, and we can choose a p-value, so that's your alpha. We arbitrarily chose it at 0 0.05. Doesn't have to be. We could have chosen 0 0.1, we could have chosen 0 0.01. There's some post hoc analysis. This is, this is Fisher's exact test. Anyways, we submit. Here's our analysis. And then there's some icons here which allow you to click on um, them. And um, it gives you a little more detail. So in this case, these are the compounds that have been measured. So endotoxin is lipopolysaccharide. It's a bacterial metabolite. Uh, glucose, uh, I can't remember what 3PP is. Alanine, isobutyrate, methylamine. Um, and then these are the original concentrations between 0%, 15% for this compound, uracil. So we click on uracil. Up pops these plots. So a chart, and here's a box plot. This is the normalized concentrations. So at 0% grain, or grass-fed cattle, you can see something here. And then for the grain-fed cattle, you can see something here. And by the ANOVA test, we can be quite confident, in terms of the p-value, at 0 0.0002, that yes, this is different than these other three. That's what the ANOVA test is supposed to tell us. So grass-fed, clearly different than the other three at this level. We could have clicked on this one, and maybe we find that uh, this one is different than these three. I don't know. But you can query each one of these by clicking on this information. So as I say, you, you did your ANOVA. Zoom in, clicking on here, to tell us what's going on with, with in particular, what are these compounds. What is that red and uh, so these are ones that are significant, and these are ones that are insignificant. So, so that means which are significant, uh, different for, for other four groups? So because yeah, so this is a measure of the log, log P. So 0 0.05 is here, mm -hmm. and this is you know, 0 0.00001. Okay, but still, like, it's like showing the different metabolite, metabolite like each point is uh, referring to one metabolite? Yeah, each metabolite is a certain metabolite. There were 47, and we, it's too hard to write out 47 yeah, names yeah. on a graph. But so that's why it allows you to zoom in. It's just telling me like a general p-value for all four groups if there is a significant difference between four groups, right? Yeah, so it's one of the four. So it's a one-way ANOVA test that's being done, not a three-way or a four-way. It's just the one way. It's just saying, is at least one of these different from the other three? So this is allowing us to look at the details, to look at the specific compounds, and to identify which ones are most significant. In this case, LPS is the most significantly different glucose the next one. So we're going to ask you some questions, and this is what we'd like you to do as you're going through this. So I'm stepping you through, but I'd like you guys to do this uh, after lunch on, yourself, on your own and, and to try and answer some of these questions. So in addition to that um, zooming in, we could have also clicked on this graph. Um, ANOVA, and now it's essentially looking at this, well, this is the correlation. Um, and we're seeing essentially a heat map. Um, and uh, we're seeing essentially some general broad clusters, uh, which are grouping certain types of metabolites. And then we're also seeing certain groups here, which correspond, I believe, to, uh, I don't know, grain-fed and grass-fed. Um, we can take those plots, those images, and we can actually go to the image center and we can convert and print those plots so we could use them for papers or presentations. And so you can adjust the resolution, format, size, and the 
save that or uh, download that particular image. So again, these are sets of questions we'd like you guys to try and answer in the course of the lab that you'll be doing after lunch. You can also do something that's sort of um, it's looking for specific patterns. So in this case, we're looking at four different states. You could think of this as almost like a temporal study. Um, you know, 0, 15, 30, 45. It could be days, hours, whatever. These are sort of states. Uh, but we're looking for perhaps trends or maybe there's a periodic trend. And as I say, if you're trying to plot a trend, you need more than two points, three or four. And so this actually has four sets. And as we go from 0, 15, 30, 45, does something climb? Does something fall? We don't know. And so what we're going to do is look for this pattern to see if we can find trends. In this case, the pattern we're looking to see is, do things go from low to, to middle to higher and higher? So do things go up? So we're looking for things that are trending to, according to this, 0, 15, 30, 45. We could look for things going down. We could look for things that go up and then down. We could go, you know, any sort of pattern. Is it always like this, that the first row is, like, um, say what you're referring to, and the yeah. ones below just, you know, generalize? That's right. So this is a pattern that we're looking for and see if there's certain metabolites that do follow this particular pattern. And so which ones actually have this climbing pattern? Well, you get more and more LPS as you go higher and higher levels of grain. You get more and more glucose as you get higher and higher levels. These are the strongest ones with the strongest correlation. And this is a measure of their correlation coefficient. So this one is up around about 0 0.7. This is maybe about 0.6. I can't read it that well. But there are also some that have the opposite. They have a negative correlation. Instead of going 1, 2, 3, 4, they go 4, 3, 2, 1. So the strongest one is 3PP. Now, if you recall, I think it was endotoxin has the highest, but then I think 3PP was like number three in terms of the ANOVA test. So, you know, one was way up, one was way down. So I think if you looked at the 3PP, you'd see something else distinguished between the two cohorts or the three cohorts. But again, we're seeing different trends. And then things that are around, you know, negative 0.3 and positive 0.3, well, those aren't really strong correlations. So you can kind of make your decision about which ones you want to keep, which ones are most interesting, but these are trends that you can see. And so uh, some questions that you guys can answer. So we've gone and done um, you know, several steps in data processing. We've done the ANOVA. We've done some correlation analysis. We've done a few heat maps. Now we can get to the thing that we were, everyone likes to do. This is what's normally published. And so we're now going to PCA. Um, we have four groups and uh, roughly 10 samples in each group. And um, here is what the clusters look like. Now these are labeled. So I think if we didn't label them, I think it would be a little difficult to actually see any kind of clusters. This like a big mess. But what you can see is we've labeled the grass fed, grain fed at 15, um, uh, 30, and 45. So I think if we just labeled 0 and 45, you'd see two very distinct clusters. Uh, but we're including this progression. And you can actually kind of see a progression. Things are sort of dropping this way uh, in terms of your scores plot. We can look at the loading plot and say, what are the compounds that are causing this drift, the separation as they go from here down to here? So as the, as the proportion, this is the grass fed, this is the heavy grain fed. So we look along this direction to see which ones are driving that shift in the PCA plot, the scores plot. And the loading plot tells us, and it tells us that endotoxin and glucose and isobutyrate and 3PP are the ones that are pushing it. And that's what we exactly got when we did the correlation analysis. Endotoxin and glucose, isobutyrate and 3PP, if you look at their ANOVA test, the most significant ones, identifies these ones as well. Yes, there's aspartate, and yes, there's you know, maybe valine, but those don't seem to be driving this trend which goes from here to here on your 
scores plot. Here, here. So you're looking for direction or shift from here to here. So on your so the blue one, the, the light blue one, is with the highest uh, square frame factor. Yeah. And that's why. So we're looking for things along this direction that are most different. It's just like because my score plots are like this, right? So that's why in the end, if we want to go in order to yeah. we are looking for that. Yeah. Okay, so we can do two dimensional PCA. You can also do three dimensional PCA. Um, and uh, I don't. This is from the same data. No, this is uh, from Hans Ulrich. Uh, Hans Ulrich. Uh, Which one? This is from Hans Ulrich. Oh, it was a time series data. Yeah. Okay, so this is a sample three-dimensional PCA. You guys will try and generate one, uh, which hopefully would, would be corresponding to what you see with the, the, the cattle data. Um, but as I say, what are the ones that contribute? And so you'll try and answer some questions. So we saw some clustering. You see some trends. They're interesting. Let's see if we can now use the heavy artillery and see if we can exaggerate that trend. So now we're going from, we've gone from ANOVA to correlation, PCA, now we're going to click on PLSDA. So click here, and we're going to click on a 2D score plot. And now you can see here's grass fed, 15% grain fed, 30% grain fed, 40%. So maybe if we just ignore the dark blue, we can see actually three very distinct clusters. So PLSDA has sort of pulled things a little further apart and made it a little more distinct than what we originally saw from the PCA. So we can get Q squared and R squared values. This is through the cross-validation. And the choice is how many components we'll use to calculate Q squared and R squared. So there's, we max the number that we typically use is a relatively small number, typically five or six do that cross-validation. We've done tenfold cross-validation. And what it's showing up is that things start to stabilize in terms of the R squared, which is uh, almost 1, and the Q squared, which is about 0.8, after about 3. And this is a measure of the accuracy overall. So, so these are three components to use, essentially, in terms of the modeling. And this is one of the mysteries of Simca P, I think, in terms of how many components. But overall, this is a very robust PLSDA model. So this is telling us that it's A, strong, and B, not overtrained. What are the components that are driving this PLSDA model? Well, not unusual. The same ones that we saw with the ANOVA, the same ones we saw with um, the correlation analysis, the same ones we saw with the PCA um, uh, plots. So 3PP, endotoxin, glucose. Then there's alanine, which we hadn't seen before. Uh, here's uracil, which we've seen before. And these are indicating uh, how they're different. And this is indicating their trend. So from high to medium to low, from low to medium to high. So some of them are having opposite trends. That's also depicted in this variable importance plot. I don't understand. Now we have more components, right? We have uh, like it's not working at three metabolites. It's a, it's a it's a way of assessing. So it's not looking at three metabolites. Yeah. Okay. It's just how it's doing its cross validation. So, but I can't see that, right? I mean, three component model. I don't. It's not visualized. No, it's just simply a matter of it's how you do R squared Q squared, and usually. The R squared Q squared analysis is still a mystery. It's not formally published in any books because the people who did this are uh, run a commercial enterprise. So we just tried to emulate what they did. <laughs> um, so this, as I say, is this is more conventional. The statistics are more interpretable. Um, okay. Then the permutation test, which is something I prefer over R squared and Q squared. So we're 
here, we click on the permutation, and here it's done 100 permutations. It could have done 1,000. <coughs> but with 100 permutations, you can see that it's not a single model outperformed the first one. So because no models outperformed it, in fact, this model is so much better, you can be certain that the statistics better than 0 0.01. If you did 1,000 ones, it's going to be less than 0 0.01. If you did 10,000, it'll still be less than 0 0.001. This is a really good model. And so that's confirmed, as I say, by the R squared Q squared values. So these are, again, some questions you can try and answer. So we've done ANOVA, correlations, patterns. Uh, now we can do some heat map uh, analysis. And here is our heat map. It's a little dark, might be better on your, but here are the four clusters. Here's the 45%, here's the grass fed, 15%, 30%. And you can see, partly by visualization, you can see that there's a distinct cluster in what the 45% the and it's, there's more red here. With the 30%, there's more red here. With the grass fed, the red is over here. So you can kind of see that they're, they're clear clusters, and so this is quite distinct. Um, then there's the metabolites that are listed here that sort of help with the distinction. Again, this is just another way of visualizing the data. But I think hopefully you're getting the message is that whether we used ANOVA, whether we used PLS, whether we used PCA, you're getting a lot of the same answers, the things that were driving the differences. So the four groups mm -hmm. uh, clustered together rather than put together, right? Yes, they, they separately clustered, yeah. Oh, really? It's perfect the cluster, I mean. Yeah, it looks like it. Oh. So they're like the right to 10 cents. Right, And that was the only cent cluster. So you're just clustering, you didn't cluster this one on, on the metabolism? Yeah, Actually, I'm quite sure if you cluster on these, you'd still get them separated very clearly. Yeah. Okay. Always alter. Always. Always. <laughs> Always. <laughs> but no, I think so. Anyways, but it, is, that, is, that, is that because it's too not reorganized, or, or why? You have options. I mean, this is just these are the tools that you can choose. You can reorganize yeah, but by. But does it make do not reorganize and not? Uh, or if I would not take that box, what would be different? Do not reorganize. Yeah, if, if so you would get that. It would, you it would have another dendrogram. Yeah. Dendrogram on yeah. full dimension. Yeah. So this is this sorting on these ones. If we then we have this one, and then <coughs> Jeff said we might have one, maybe one here moving down to here. But you'd see the four groups pretty nicely separated. So, in terms. so it would not be showing the four groups. It would show like. Uh, well, this is why you're supposed to do this. This is what we can do after lunch. So you get to explore and try this out, and you get to try and answer some of these questions. So we've done about a half dozen analyses, and at this stage, uh, it's generated a fair bit of data, and so you can actually download it. Um, and some of them can be figures, some of them can be reports. So in this case, this is the analysis report. And so it it writes your paper for you. Um, and uh, so it explains things, produces the plots, the tables, and, and values. You just have to write the introduction. OK, so that's stepping through the, the, the analysis approach. And I so think the point being is that there's lots of options. I'm trying to demonstrate it. It's, it's for you guys afterwards to, to try and play around, to also try and answer some of the questions that we've posed. Now, within um, metaboanalysts, there's also this component called metabolite set enrichment analysis, which is based similar to gene set enrichment analysis, which is used in, in transcriptomics. Um, and within gene set enrichment analysis, there's sort of subsets, um, but there's over-representation analysis, 
as quantitative enrichment analysis and there's single sample profiling. To make gene set enrichment analysis, you actually have to have metabolite sets. So there's a lot of sets that were uh, from disease groups, there's some from pathways, metabolic pathways, and then there's this one, I guess it was mostly from the SNP set, I think, that was published a few years ago. Yeah, so it's a little, little biased that way. But these are things that people are going to be adding and could be added to this. But the point is that, you know, we found separation. Oh, we found 3PP, we found glucose endotoxin. That's making a difference. Um, but what are they, you know, what's the biology with that? What are significant rich? What correspond to certain pathways or to diseases? Or are they localized in certain organelles or tissues? Now, the problem is that we were doing this stuff with cattle. Um, and this whole MSEA is really designed for uh, humans. Um, and, and humans don't have rumen, and we're not ruminants, and so um, we're going to shift a little bit. And we're not going to use the rumen data. We're going to use uh, some human data that was collected. Um, to do this, uh, as I say, you can look at, you can input data that's just lists of metabolites. So glucose, um, endotoxin, PPA, those could have been our list of metabolites. We could go a little further, we could look at, here's our list of metabolites and here's their concentrations that were significant or of interest. Or we could have, you know, it's almost the original data set, uh, just as it was when we started doing our PCA analysis. So, in terms of over-representation analysis, if we've got our lists of compounds that um, are, are important, uh, the ones that we identified from our PCA analysis. We just type in that list of about 15 or 20. And then it will go through its libraries and see if these are associated with any particular pathways, diseases, or other things that are already known. We could now have just a list of concentrations, glucose, methylamine, whatever, <coughs> and their actual concentrations. Then it's going to look up standard known concentrations, normal concentrations, to see if some of those are also unusual, and then identify some pathways. And then you can have the full data set, all the compounds, everything, concentration data, um, all the full metabolite set, and then it will do a, a more detailed analysis of saying based what's what's enriched. And then we can interpret this. So as I said, MSEA only works for human data. So that may rule out about half the people in this room. It's just hard. We don't have, I mean, of the organisms that have been studied, um, uh, humans are certainly the, the best studied ones. But it does allow you to create your own custom sets. So if you've happened to collect a lot of data for certain standard organisms. So we're going to look at lung cancer and colon cancer patients. And they were suffering cancer cachexia. And as I say, we have these three options, ORA, single sample profiling, or QEA. So we're going to choose the first one. Here's our list of metabolites. So this 70 odd metabolites. Um, this is their names, They're just names, so we don't even have to worry about concentrations. Uh, again, it's useful to have some quantitative metabolomics. Um, and what it'll do is it'll just make sure that we didn't have any typos, and it turns out someone mistyped isoleucine. They didn't put an E before the U, and so this picked this up, and so it's now trying to map this name to possible names to possible identifiers, PubChem identifiers, PEG identifiers. So we're just going to make sure that your name and spelling is correct. And you can say, yes, sorry, I made a mistake. Because um, again, when you've got lists of compounds, there's usually about 10 synonyms for every compound. Uh, everyone uses their own preferred synonym. So this is important, this name normalization is what it's called. And then we can say, and say okay, are these metabolites, can we see, are they associated with any pathways? Um, since this is collected from urine, we could have looked for disease associations. Uh, we could look for associations with metabotypes and SNPs. Uh, there's other metabolite sets that are also in. And then we could have had a self-defined metabolite set. So if we defined something for cattle that we knew about, we could have created something like that. But it just hasn't a lot of work done on cattle. So here's our ORA analysis on these important metabolites that we identified here. 
And interesting, the ones that are most important seem to be all associated with amino acid metabolism. What's that? Oh, what does ORA stand for? Over-representation analysis. So, anyways, cachexia is muscle wasting. Muscle is made of protein. If, if you're looking for a sign of it, you should expect, minimally, that the focus would be largely uh, amino acid metabolism. That's it's essentially catabolism. And so that's certainly some of the things that would show up. And it's branched to me, uh, serine, methionine, and then there's ammonia, which is how you get rid of protein. Uh, and then there's a few other things that are sort of perturbed, but there's a pretty clear story about which ones are most, most bothered. Um, based on this list, we can see the number of hits, they're expected, their p-values, so the ones that have the highest, you know, use 0.05, we can go from propanate and above, or the so there's six major pathways that are modified. We have some information about the false discovery rate being sort of dealt with, and we talked a little bit about false positives already. From there, we can also click on these things, and it'll take us to the SMIPDB, and it'll see or show us some of the compounds um, that are modified and, and uh, uh, the roles they play in that particular pathway. And what you want to have, which kind of value you want to have for the false discovery rate? Like, should it be very low or...? Yes, you want a low value. So that 0.05. Um, single sample profiling. So this is something that, that doctors would like to use. This is like biomarkers. So someone's coming in, you've asked them to do a urine test, and here's their concentrations from their urine. Is everything normal? So this is going to essentially look at all of the values from this patient, and it's going to see which ones are abnormal. And here are the concentrations, and here are the reference concentrations that have compiled in the HMDD. And this will compare which ones, we know this person is, I think, is this male or whatever, medium. So whether they're uh, unusual or not. And we can see if they're outside a particular range. And flag those as being possibly problematic. So in this case, it was 3 and E. And uh, this is the concentration range, which is normally seen. These are different studies that have been published, standards. Um, and this is the value that was seen for this particular patient, 93 micromolar. And you can tell that it's way above the average. So something's wrong here. They've got too much threonine coming out in their urine. And there's some references, and you can go back and track just to see what how confident that is. So that's another check. So that's a clinical style of checking. It's not necessarily a pathway style of checking. The third approach, QEA, quantitative enrichment analysis. In this case, we could just upload the whole set not just, you know, one patient. It's a whole group of patients, I think. Uh, submit that. And um, this one is identifying perturbations. And once again, we see amino acid metabolism, methionine metabolism. Betaine is another sort of amino acid. And then propanoid, which we also saw before. These are the ones that are perturbed from the full set. So this is using not one patient, but many patients, not using just a list of metabolites, but using um, you know, your, your original uh, Excel file. And it's identifying some of these pathways, very, very high or very low p-values, very low false discovery rates, as being highly perturbed. And this is essentially looking at the different matches, and I think you guys will have a chance to sort of look at this, exploring the, the metabolic changes um, that are associated with cachexia. So the question is, you guys get to answer by looking at that. So we've identified clearly some perturbations to amino acid metabolism that happen with cachexia. We've perhaps identified which ones are going up, which ones are going down. Now can we go to pathways? 
we saw how we had some links to pathways, but we're just trying to extend that MSCA analysis by looking at the pathway structures. And right now, this is a little more flexible, so it's not just for humans. It, it deals with a lot of different organisms, a lot of different model organisms. So humans, but E. coli and yeast and a few others. And these are things that were compiled from keg pathways. Um, so we can do um, metabolite pathway analysis, MET-PA, using these techniques. Uh, this is, again, we're just using example set from those cancer patients. Um, so same set that we did for MSCA. Same sort of analysis. In this case, we do auto-scaling. We're not doing any row-wise normalization. We could have, I suppose, because um, there are some dilution effects. So this is just like we did with this one. And what animal system? Are we going to look at bacteria? No, these are not bacteria. Are we going to look at plants? No, these are humans. So we clicked off the Homo sapiens. So we're going to do pathway. Uh, analysis for Homo sapiens, um, use all the compounds, you do, do a global test, and we're going to look at doing some pathway topology analysis. So there's pathway enrichment and pathway topology. So some compounds, and this is something that people have done with, with protein, protein interaction networks and gene interaction networks. So you can do the same thing with with metabolites. There are some metabolites that play a very important role. They are hubs that are highly connected. Same metabolite used as a central one. So glucose is a great hub. Um, glycine is an important hub metabolite. Uh, choline, an important hub metabolite where it branches off to many other areas. Then there are bottlenecks. This is a bottleneck. As well, but it's let's see where many paths lead to um, uh, other nodes. And so, um, whether you identify the hubs or the bottlenecks, uh, you can uh, use graph theory to, uh, to help measure those features that we sort of qualitatively identify as hubs and bottlenecks. So, degree centrality and betweenness centrality. So, something that is a hub has a high degree of centrality and something that is a bottleneck has high betweenness. So this is a quantitative measure. So here's the pathway visualization that we got from that cachexia sample. And this is the impact of the pathway and the probability of that pathway. And so we can click on this one, which is the, the most important, evidently, pathway. There's many pathways. There's 80 that are drawn here. And typically the ones that have the highest impact and the most significant. And so click on this and it shows up as a glycine serine 3 in metabolism, which is what we found from the overrepresentation analysis. But it identifies a number of compounds. These are the K diagrams. And you can click the metabolites that were significantly altered. So we're not seeing everything. Metabolomics doesn't have perfect coverage. And we can go in and click on these compounds and identify which ones were different, most different, between those, say, with cachexia and those in the controls. And we can see that in the case of serine, is somewhat higher in those with cachexia and somewhat lower than people in controls. Is that box plot plot? That's a box plot, yeah. Okay. But the, um, the box plot will give us the median. Are you, are you showing what's the mean? It shows the mean, and then it, it would have the standard deviations or those variations about it. So we can also go a little further, and, and these are the ones that we're seeing for all of the pathways, all of the hits, again, tables of statistics, and their impact value, and, and so on. So that is a short synopsis of Metaboanalyst. I think uh, you could easily spend a day doing everything, exploring everything. We didn't do things like k-means clustering. We didn't use SOMs. We didn't use SVMs or random force. You guys are free to try that out. We didn't do time series analysis, although we used the, the four states for the cattle feeding as sort of a, a proxy for time. There's things called two-factor analysis. We didn't do some of the data quality checking, which um, you could do. Uh, we didn't look up peak searching. 
So this is just some output that uh, Jeff compiled of, of types of time series analysis that can be done and have been done um, for metaboanalyst. Uh, so certain types of graphs, and then there's some data quality checking. And as I say, this is where we're looking at batch effects, batch one, batch two, batch three, and here's batch four. And the blacks are the quality controls that were spiked in. You can see that they're tightly grouped. Even this one is tightly grouped, but the quality controls would have said this was fine, but the whole average has been shifted. And so we would have have to or still have to adjust that. So with the quality control checks, it's possible to look for batch to batch changes. And I think this is very important in, in a lot of metabolomic studies that um, it can cause a few heartaches and headaches. So that's the synopsis of metaboanalyst.